Alan, thank you very much for that, and that gives me great pleasure to ask uh, Professor Martin Pugh to, um, to talk to us and uh, enlighten us further. Thank you very much. And in fact, I would pick up perhaps that last point to start with. Um, <coughs> liberals, I think, have been in the past far too hesitant about claiming Churchill, um, but shouldn't be because, you know, Churchill does cause an awful lot of problems for the Conservatives. <laughs> they are very confused about him and quite <coughs> not so long ago, you, will, you may remember that when Mrs Thatcher was Prime Minister, she did occasionally make a reference to our Winston, of course she didn't know much history, even, even the history of the Conservative Party. But other people in the Conservative Party, who obviously were, let us say, discombobulated at Thatcherism and didn't know where this creed fitted in, decided to do, you know, to look back, research through the party's history, um, to see you know, where did Conservatism begin? What is true Conservatism? Um, people like um, Andrew Roberts, who came out with that book called Eminent Churchillians, a series of, um, of essays, which doesn't act really give you much about, it certainly doesn't give you Churchill, and it doesn't give you many eminent Churchillians, because there weren't many eminent Churchillians. The nearest he gets is Walter Monckton, who was Churchill's Minister for Labour. And of course, Andrew Roberts hated Walter Monckton and all similar ministers. The point is, of course, that when Conservative historians went back a little way, they discovered Churchill and his 1951-55 government, his only peacetime um, Conservative government, and of course they were dismayed because they weren't <coughs> finding what they had hoped to find. They found this man who appeared to be, and in many ways was, upholding what we would nowadays call post-war consensus politics. Full employment, welfare state, consulting the trade unions and, and what have you. Everything, in other words, that Mrs. Thatcher thought was, you know, perfectly, perfectly dreadful, so very upsetting. And this, of course, is why other Conservatives, David Willits, for example, who wrote a book on the subject, quite a good book, actually, all the way back to Lord Liverpool, who was Prime Minister in 1812 to 1827, in a desperate search to find a halfway decent Conservative. And you will, you will notice that although Conservatives sometimes talk about Peelite Conservatism and Disraelian Conservatism, um, very often these days are called Lord Salisbury's Conservatism, and even perhaps sometimes this is Thatcher's. They never talk about Churchillian Conservatism, do they? And the, the answer is that in spite of Andrew Roberts' nicely titled book, Eminent Churchillian, of course, there isn't really, there wasn't a body of, conserva of Churchillian Conservatives, and there isn't really ever a coherent body of Churchillian Conservative thought. So they really are in difficulties. So let us take comfort. As Alan has said, it's a 19-year career for Churchill as a Liberal. And remember, it wasn't just 19 years, but within that, what, he's Liberal President of the Board of Trade and Home Secretary um, and, uh, of course, First Lord of the Admiralty before and up to the war, um, and then briefly Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, goes out, comes back in under Lloyd George, Minister, <coughs> Minister for Munitions, then, of course, Secretary of State for War and Air Minister. He actually combined the two. Such was <laughs> his enormous energy. Um, and then Colonial Secretary. We're still with Liberalism. So there is a very formidable, um, there is a very formidable record, even if even if one doesn't regard it all as 100% pucker Liberalism. There's a, there's an awful lot of it there. <coughs> Why liberal in the first place? Well, that's in a sense the easy part, isn't it? Because um, having started off briefly as an enthusiastic, um, freshly out of the Boer War, um, conservative imperialist and, and the MP for Oldham, um, he, he, he did come adrift. He was a rebel almost from the start, actually, even before Joseph Chamberlain presented um, the tariff reform campaign. Churchill was already rebelling against the, the, um, the party, to the irritation, obviously, of his leaders, Arthur Balfour, who famously said, I thought he was a young man of promise, but I see that he is a young man of promises. <laughs>
<laughs> Balfour dismissal, as Churchill is already showing signs of, of slipping across. But yes, his support for free trade has always attracted accusations of sheer opportunism against Churchill. And of course it was a good time, 1904 was a good time to be leave, leaving the Conservative Party, just as 1923 was a good time to be leaving the Liberal Party. And Churchill was an ambitious, he was a young man in a hurry, he wanted to get there, uh, and he wasn't going to be promoted by the Conservatives, I think we can say with some reason, not certainly, but, but he was right in thinking he wasn't going to get very far with the Conservatives. And the other thing one should say, against the charge of opportunism, is that Churchill was always a free trader. He didn't give it up. Even when he did rejoin the Conservative Party and became Chancellor of the Exchequer, he kept his free trade um, um, views, views in, intact. So I think the question um, is here not so much just, was he a liberal? What sort of liberal? Just as I would say the question to some extent is, what sort of Tory was he as, as well? Um, contemporaries in 1903 were obviously very unsure. Charles Trevelyan, the Liberal Northumbrian, of course, but Yorkshire MP, challenged him quite rightly on this, uh, saying, in other words, that free trade is all very well, but the Liberal Party is not a free trade party. It is only satisfied with free trade as an economic base to work from. The whole raison d'etre of present-day liberalism <coughs> is constructive reform. What I want to know is how much common ground you can find with reforming liberals on economic and social questions. The reform forces in the party are vastly stronger than ten years ago, and I am certain they will never check themselves for the sake of a few Tory votes. Now, Trevelyan had a point, because Churchill actually hadn't thought about it very much. He was a young man in a a hurry, to be honest, and he hadn't, he hadn't worked things out, but he was a fast worker. There is absolutely no doubt about that, and he threw himself into the new project, as he always, um, always did. Um, and, and in particular, of course, the Edwardian social reform, the state finance social reform, was something in which he was instrumental. But he didn't take to it immediately. The story, and it may be apocryphal, but the story is that when it was first mooted that Churchill might be made president of the local government board, where you'd expect to be dealing with social problems, he, he bristled a bit and said, I decline to be shut up in a soup kitchen with Mrs. Sidney Webb. And then, as I this is not, not for me. But, as Alan has correctly reminded you, it wasn't very long after that before, and it was Charles Masterman, I think, who said this of him, Churchill, he has just discovered the poor. No, he, was, uh, he uh, now what's the full, the full quotation? He, he is full of the poor whom he has just discovered. <laughs> That's how Masterman put it. So, and that, that, that does give you the, 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 the true feeling about of how many liberals thought of him at that time. He was just a bit too <coughs> fast, a bit too open, opportunistic, you know. You, you didn't know whether you could altogether trust him. But having, with that qualification, he picked up the idea and obviously pushed it forward as president of the Board of Trade, you know, he was responsible for the new labour exchanges and the unemployment insurance part of the, the National Insurance <coughs> Act. But this does raise the question again as to what sort of what sort of liberal Churchill was. Um, there's a, a famous letter, and he was always writing letters to poor old Asquith as leader and prime minister. They're all sitting in Asquith's papers these days. Um, uh, this is a great one in 1908, where he's he's more or less setting up the whole agenda for the government, I mean, you know, this is an ambitious, ambitious thing. He could tell us that everything the, the Liberal government ought to be, to be doing over the next few years. And he says, um, he's very keen on Germany. We need to learn from Germany, okay, where they've, they've pioneered these things. Um, she has managed to establish tolerable basic conditions for her people. She is organised not only for war, but for peace. We are organised for nothing except party politics. <laughs> the minister who will apply to this country the successful experience of Germany in social organisation will leave a memorial which time will not deface. And here it goes. One, labour exchanges, unemployment insurance, 
national infirmity, that means health, insurance, expansive state industries, forestation, roads, modernised rail, <coughs> railway amalgamation with state control, education, compulsory until 17, which at that time was going into it. I say, thrust a big slice of Bismarckianism over the whole underside of our industrial system and await the consequences with whatever they may be with good conscience. Now, that's the word, Bismarckianism. You don't usually link it to the books. <laughs> but, and, and so, what, but you might link it to conservatives, of course, of a certain sort. And Churchill, I think, was, insofar as he's a conservative, he did reflect that strand, and it was a very strong strand, within British conservatism that took a positive view of the state and saw the state as a positive engine for improving the lives of the of, of, of the people. That's the Bismarckianism <coughs> element. So you can take pay your money and take your choice here. If, if you like to see him as a conservative, that's the sort of conservative he was. But if you he's a liberal, this is the sort of liberal he was. He was not any way embarrassed about about using the power of the State. I would add to this, um, and I would stress this, one other one, we're on Churchill's Edwardian liberal friends, Home Secretary, which I know Alan has mentioned. Everybody knows about Churchill out there at the siege of Sydney Street, which does seem typical in some ways, but we do tend to forget what a liberal Home Secretary he actually was behind that. Um, he hated the idea of locking up loads of young men for petty offences. There's a famous case where he, he heard that a boy of 12 had stolen a piece of fish and been sentenced to seven years by the magistrate. Churchill had, him di had it dis discharged straight away. You know, th this, is the sort of, this is the sort of thing. And uh, you know, he was called upon, of course, as Home Secretary to administer the Conservatives' Aliens Act of 1905, which was supposed to keep Jews out, and of course um, didn't really implement it. I mean, this is this is this is more or less the truth of the of the matter. Um, and he criticised the police if he thought they were harassing refugees, people of, of, of that sort. And he he's very outspoken in upholding the Victorian liberal belief in in Britain as a natural home for both economic refugees and political asylum seekers. He defended what he called the old tolerant practice of free entry and asylum, to which this country has so long adhered and from which it has so greatly gained. Uh, this is the classic, these are classic liberal sentiments. And when I look at the whole phalanx of 20th century home secretaries, I'm not sure that I can see, with the exception of Roy Jenkins, another really liberal <coughs> man in this in this office. So it's it's more unusual than than you might than you might think. So so far we're doing quite well, I think, on the Churchill as 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 liberal um, as liberal front. But of course he came adrift from the Liberal Party and from liberalism to some extent. It's bound up in the first instance with the way the First World War um, disrupted his career um, and of course because of his um, unpopularity over the Dardanelles campaign, for which he obviously did bear heavy personal responsibility, um, he did lose office because Asquith didn't, um, in, in, in the, in the, um, when Asquith formed the coalition in 19, May 1915, he demoted Churchill originally, and then somewhat later <coughs> Churchill just got fed up because he was Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and, and so decided he, he asked actually to be made a general immediately, <laughs> um, which wasn't granted, but he did then, at least he went off to fight. But of course, with the split of the Liberal Party between Asquith and Lloyd George um, on <coughs> December 1916, uh, changed the course of events again because um, well, it forced most liberals to make some sort of a choice, which is awkward in itself. Um, Lloyd jo uh, Churchill, I think, would have served perfectly happily under either leader. But in the event, of course, Lloyd George invited him in July 1917 to return to government as Minister for Munitions, which he, um, Churchill, accepted very 
um, very, very happily, I think. So that did mean that he's then, in a sense, committed to the Lloyd George Liberal Party, in, 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 although it wasn't yet a formal party at all, but he understandably that commits him, and, and um, it means that at the 1918 general election he's elected um, with the coupon in Dundee, of course, um, as, as a Lloyd George Liberal. And subsequently, of course, he, like Lloyd George, had to face the question, where, where are we going next? If the Liberal Party is split and everything's topsy-turvy, um, now, of course, he, like Lloyd George, was very attracted by what contemporaries call fusion. <coughs> this, the idea simply is that, was, that the old parties and the old issues have become a bit irrelevant as a result of the war, so we form a new one. Lloyd George Liberals, Progressive Conservatives, National Labour, a new, whatever we call it, National Party, it's called Fusion. Um, well, all right, it, the long and the short of it is it, it didn't come off, so the, not enough of the Conservatives would have it. Um, the, the Liberals thought um, we're not going anywhere under Lloyd George just at the moment, so Churchill backed out. But it would have been a perfect, um, a perfect expedient for him, actually, I think, if, if it had ever happened. So the result is, you see, that, that in the absence of fusion, Churchill's more or less stuck there, <coughs> drifting on. He's still got ministerial office, obviously, up until 1922, uh, when the Conservatives finally pulled the rug from under Lloyd George. But of course, then at that election, he was defeated um, um, at Dundee. And for just one more election in 1923, as a Liberal, and again defeated. Um, so he's running out of options, and he's also getting a bit irritated, especially with Asquith. Remember that following the inconclusive results of the 1923 election, um, and the first Labour government took office in January 1924, and Churchill was inclined to blame Asquith for allowing that to happen. A bit unfairly, I think, but, but he did anyway, and he, he, this, in a sense, is pushing him further away from his, his own party. And so, as is, is well known, he made his way back into conservatism uh, by 1923, though he, noticed wouldn't call himself a conservative. He took the label constitutionalist initially as candidate at, at Epic, which tells you um, um, something, because, of course, he didn't have he was just an individual, all right, a big individual, but, but really no organised following in, 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 a, in a sense um, there. So he, <coughs> the question is, again, what sort of, what sort of conservative was Churchill from this, um, this point um, onwards? Uh, again, we're familiar with the ferocious anti-Bolshevik rhetoric that Churchill produced at this, at this time. Now, I'm always a little bit, I never take Churchill's rhetoric too literally, for this good reason that I think you said Sir Edward Grey noticed, that Churchill was a man who was always in love with language. He just loved words. He couldn't resist them. So he, he, you know, he couldn't say, this is a bad thing. He had to say, it is a fatal, dreadful, the worst thing that's ever happened in the world. You know, it's, we're always a bit over the top here you know, in language. So I never, never set too much store on some of these, these things that he comes up with. It is, of course, widely argued um, that in delivering all these anti-socialist, anti-Bolshevik speeches, Churchill was easing his path back into the Conservative Party, presenting himself as an extreme right-winger, this is what they want. I'm very sceptical, actually, about, about this, um, about whether this is true or even whether it, um, whether, whether it was working. Churchill's views, in some ways, still hadn't changed. He said some awfully interesting things in the period when they were talking about fusion. Um, when he said, all right, you know, everybody thinks at the moment with the rise of the Labour Party that the, the debate between collectivism and nationalisation on the one hand and um, individualism and free enterprise on the other will make the great cleavage in British politics. Churchill says, I do not believe it for a moment. Every one of us is a collectivist for some things. And every one of us is an individualist or others. Mm. And it does seem to me that in many ways he, he, he sticks to this sort of line 
all through. And at this time, i.e. the post-war period, he was one of those who seems to have felt that as a result of wartime experience with government running certain industries, that the railways, for example, ought to be kept long term in some sort of state control or ownership. So I think he's probably a little bit more, um, he's not so easily categorised and compartmentalised as a right winger as one might um, suppose even at this stage. Um, the other thing is this, um, whatever we think about Baldwin, we have to ask ourselves, what did the Conservatives think they were doing in bringing him back? This is Stanley Baldwin, after all. Now, Baldwin was a very shrewd man, and he had a very clear idea about managing the Conservative Party, um, and he intended to do it by modernising the party, marginalising its right wing, keeping it in the centre, appealing to former liberal votes, and all sorts of things like this. This is how Baldwin was trying to reconstruct the Conservative Party to make it fit for winning elections under conditions of the new mass democracy after 1918. So, Baldwin wasn't looking for a Churchill who was you know, breathing fire and brimstone and, and being, making it more right-wing than it was already. This wasn't what he wanted. He was, he was literally marginalised in right-wingers. So my feeling is that um, Churchill was actually part of Baldwin's liberalising strategy, implausible as that may, may sound in view of what happened later on. But I do think at the time, this is where Churchill fitted into the scheme of things. And that, of course, is partly why Baldwin was willing to make him Chancellor of the Exchequer after the return to office in 1924, when Churchill, of course, was, as we said, still a free, a free trader. This is, this is where it all fits. It's part of, if you like, consolidating the conservative centre of politics. That, at least, is how I think I would see it from the conservative side of the fence. But as we know, after that, things went downhill pretty dramatically, um, although Churchill had a relatively quiet period as Chancellor of the Exchequer, then of course he, he fell out with the party pretty seriously, <coughs> partly over Indian reform, as Alan has said. Then there was the abdication crisis in 1936, when um, Churchill again, by supporting the King's cause, demonstrated and proved to many Conservatives that he was pure opportunist, you know, he was looking for a way of, of unseating Baldwin, and this was seen as thoroughly disloyal um, and ungrateful for you know, what Baldwin had done for him. And then, of course, Churchill moves into the, the wider campaign over rearmament and appeasement, where again he wasn't very credible because of his record. He had a very good record, Churchill, whether he was a liberal or a conservative, he had quite a good record in trying to reduce expenditure on armaments, actually. In spite of, in spite of the fact that he talks big about, about war and the army and the navy and everything, he actually tends to reduce what he spends on the armed forces. So he, he was very credible when he attacked um, the, um, the leadership on, uh, on this, sort of, um, this sort of issue. And it is noticeable that the leading conservative opponents of appeasement, like Sir Anthony Eden, <coughs> tried to keep their distance from Churchill because they felt that their criticism of appeasement would only be damaged by association with this man. Everything that Churchill touches looks like a personal campaign, they felt, but we don't want to be you know, damaged by, by this. So, so he just gets more and more isolated, really, um, and it is only this accident um, in 1940 that brings him back to the top of politics at the age of, of 66. Remember, um, most historians would say about Churchill's rise to the premiership in 1940 that if the Conservative MPs had had anything as disgraceful as an election at that time, they would not have chosen Churchill. They would have chosen Lord Halifax as, as leader and minister. Um, in the event, Halifax backed down. So he became prime minister, but not, notice, not party leader. Um, while Ch Neville Chamberlain lived, he <coughs> continued to be leader. Only when he died did the party reluctantly take, take um, Churchill. And that goes a little way, I think, to explaining why at the 1945 election Churchill didn't do as well as he might have expected.
<coughs> people did have a notion that he is somewhat separate from the Conservative Party. After all, he <coughs> spent all the 1930s fighting the Conservative machine. He was very detached from it, and during the war, though leader, um, he frankly neglected the Conservative Party machine very badly. So it makes some sense, you know, he was, he was a, a detached figure. Which brings us almost back to Churchill's liberalism again, of course, with the, his return to power in 1951, when he seems to have offered Clement Davis, the liberal leader, um, coalition, at least offering him a, a, a post as um, a, education minister, which Clement Davis turned down, I think, rather wisely, um, on, uh, on balance. But why? Well, there may have been an element of sentiment <coughs> on Churchill's part. Uh, he's an old man, 27, <coughs> returning, in some sense, to his early days. There, there's some sense of gratitude and sentiment to, uh, uh, towards the Liberal Party. Um, I think is still there. There's also an electoral factor, obviously, because the Conservatives were anxious, given their very precarious position at the 1951 election, and were anxious to try and consolidate as much Liberal support in the, the country. And above all, of course, as I suggested right at the start, as Prime Minister, Churchill did broadly pursue consensus politics. Um, um, there's a great deal of continuity. It's hidden, of course, by his rhetoric, you know, we've got all the rhetoric about, you know, condemning socialism and all that sort of thing, um, which is great, you know, for his followers. But when you look at the policies, it's much, there's a lot of continuity um, on, on, on his, on his part, which is why, as I say, he hasn't been altogether appreciated by uh, later Conservatives. And the result is, as I say, that he eventually retired in 1955, a great man, but without really a coherent following, either as a Conservative or as a Liberal. Um, it is remarkable that someone with such a long career, with so many achievements, and with so much to say for himself on almost every subject, ends up without leaving some sort of coherent body of thought or, or organised body of followers. It is really quite unusual, but that seems to be the case. And that only means that Liberal Democrats should take that opportunity to make the most of Churchill's liberalism. <laughs>